Will the Saints sign Chase Young, make a big splash in free agency? Why did they do it, even though he needs neck surgery? We'll talk about that next on the Saints Insider Podcast. Today is Wednesday, March the 20th. I'm Zach Ewing. This is Matthew Paris, Luke Johnson, and Jeff Duncan. And uh, we are going to go through the next half hour or so, talk a lot of Chase Young, a few of the Saints' other signings, where they're at in the offseason, and maybe start to just take our first look ahead in earnest to the draft and some pro days and things like that. So uh, let's get going. Thank you for being with us. And a uh, reminder to subscribe to the SaintsOnNola.com YouTube channel and uh, leave comments below. We always see way more viewers than we have subscribers. So go ahead and click subscribe. It's it's easy. It's free. Um, and we appreciate it. We're also, by the way, stick around for the end of the show. This is what we're true experts on. Because you know how the winner of your March Madness office pool is always the guy or girl who knows absolutely nothing about college basketball? There's not a lot of college basketball knowledge up here, but I'll bet you one of us nails the Final Four. God. Uh, I just looked at the bracket for the first time uh, five minutes ago. So if I nail it, then you're absolutely nailing that uh, that theory there. I've watched maybe zero seconds of college basketball this year. Can't wait to share my expertise on that. I, I went through a period in my life where I watched a lot of college basketball, like when I was in college and a couple years after that. And those were the worst years I ever did in bracket challenges because you start to analyze, well, this team has a great inside game and this team, uh, you know, is up tempo and this team is down tempo and they don't match up. And, and you, you just think yourself into a tizzy. And then on the first day of the tournament, two 13 seeds win. And you're like, well, there goes my bracket. I'm a champion of multiple brackets entries just for that, that purpose. J- just yeah, chaos. Having, having yeah. multiple, multiple champions. By the right, way, you're yeah. trying to win. I wore my New so Mexico hat. So you're going to pick hat. a final eight. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All different. I wore my New Mexico fours, hat in honor of the Lobos. So go, go Lobos the pun Friday. That's my childhood You got a little team. bit of a flat bill going. A lot little flat this, bill. This, yeah. This yeah. Ball. Uh, we should have brought our hats. I know. Why don't we bring? Uh, next time. Told. Next time. All right, let's talk Chase Young. Uh, that's what the people are here for. Chase Young signed on Monday by the Saints. And they now <clears throat> announced it on Monday? Um, yes. Yes. $13 million one-year deal. Matt, and this morning we actually got some details on his contract, which we'll get to. Uh, we did a reaction podcast, if you haven't checked that out. If you're listening on the podcast feed, by the way, that one's only on YouTube. So you go over to the SaintsOnNola.com YouTube channel for our quick reaction to that. Um, any additional thoughts in that vein, Luke? Uh, I mean, obviously this is a guy who could help the Saints, but what we didn't know at that time was he also needs neck surgery and is not going to be ready for the start of training camp. That's probably why he was available to the Saints. At the deal they got him at. Um, yeah, I imagine there would have been... A, look, this sort of stuff comes up when you're, you're doing free agent visits. You do medicals with teams. Um, and, you know, I'm sure this scared some teams off. Um, and this is this is the type of player the Saints can bring in. Right? The, the extremely high upside, but there's a lot of risk with it. Um, and, you know, we were talking about it in terms of risk, just in terms of, of his past injury history and... Uh, you know, that sometimes where he wasn't as productive on the field. It's a risky signing in terms of that. But then you you learn about the neck injury, and there's additional risk to it. But this is this is where they're at in terms of player acquirement. And, and um, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to go at the top of the market and find guys who have these squeaky clean medicals, and, and you figure you can just drop them in and guarantee they're going to succeed. It's, you know, it's a little bit of a dice roll. Um, it could turn out to be great, and it could turn out to be a disaster. It's just kind of the way it is. Uh, optically, Dunk, the, the Saints, I think, benefit from making a splash from doing something. But now you also have this the juxtaposition of that with they brought in another injured defensive lineman. What are they doing? So it's, uh, it, yeah, it's look, interesting. I, I just think it's interesting. That's the the aspect of the team they elected to make the dice roll on, pass rush. We know they need pass rush, but they've got a bunch of other dice rolls already on the roster. So... I don't know. That that's a weird one. It it is strike me as weird. You've already got some depth there. You got some talent. Uh it does say a lot about what they think of Peyton Turner and Isaiah Fosca. We've talked about that, but uh, you know, you just drafted a guy in the second round, you drafted a guy in the first round. That should have taken care of your pass rush issues. Clearly it didn't. And uh I think it 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 speaks volumes to what they think of their their players at that position, and Cam Jordan, who who we saw tail off a year ago, uh, as well. So uh, I understand it, but it it just seems strange to me. I mean, I I could have seen them taking a a gamble on a different 
position, a receiver or somebody like that, as opposed to a position where they've already got potentially some answers there. Yeah, but I, I mean, I just think they they were so toothless with the pass rush last year. You, you just can't you can't go into the the 2020, 2024 season with the same cast of characters. Like you just can't. Yeah, but um, I mean, he's not exactly a sure thing. But I mean, when he's like, on, he's really on. I mean, that's yeah. that's the thing is you know well, you look back at that. Yeah, <laughs> that, well, that, no, it's true. That's a good point. I, it's it's a, just the dice roll. But when, I, I think I think I'd rather take the the dice roll on that than. You know, Peyton Turner, who's played in yes. what, like ten games his whole career. I mean, oh. how many sacks did he have last year? Uh, None. Chase Young or Peyton Turner? Chase Young. Chase seven Young had seven and a half. Yeah. Seven and a half plus one in the Super Bowl. Now, what? Those yeah. seven and a half. He had seven and a half in twenty twenty. Seven and a half last year. I think he played much better in twenty twenty. Most of his sacks last year were with Washington. Pretty strong start that that Chicago game specifically. Washington looked terrible for most of that game, but he racked the Bears like up front. He, they, that was probably his best game last year. But he's still the thing with Chase Young that I, gets a lot of scrutiny for him is the effort. You know, we saw that play in the NFC Championship game where he doesn't really chase down Jameer Gibbs on the backside. It, he just doesn't attack maybe the necessarily the way he used to, and that's kind of where the knee injuries come in. But he's still pretty explosive like the thing that always really frustrated Washington's coaching staff and it'll be interesting to see whether he does it here is they feel they felt like Chase Young was a much more effective rusher when he rushed with power rather than trying to rush with speed and so I think as a young player Chase Young is still developing can the Saints kind of mold him to be that power rusher can he rush can he rush the way they want to and maybe they want him to rush with speed who knows but uh, I do think there, there with some adjustments, Chase Young could still be a very good football player, and yeah, it depends on his health. But I think if we're talking about, well, why didn't they just take a gamble on another position and try and get more out of Peyton Turner or Isaiah Foskey? Well, the ceiling for Chase Young is still much, much higher than those guys. I think you also need. We, we talk about where you take your gamble. You, your partner has to want to dance too, right? Like you have to. I don't know if Tyron Smith was even interested in coming here if you wanted an offensive lineman. I mean, Chase Young was interested in coming here whether his market was suppressed because of the neck injury or not I don't know I mean I'm I'm sure well, it, was. it has to be somewhat sure but it's also good to remember that these teams the Saints included knew about the neck injury before they signed him they they you know they are aware and they think he'll be ready for the season who's the guy the Panther signed instead the guy from Minnesota right yeah uh, DJ Wanham right so they didn't they bring in Chase Young they did. Yeah, he he visited there, and he was supposed to visit Tennessee. What I'm was, not sure that, what that, was that one ever took place. What was the contract? Do you know? Anybody know? I think it was one year, $5 million, But So breaking news here, the Saints re-signed Jonathan Abram. And he'll be available on Zoom in 15 yes. minutes. <laughs> we need we need Rod Walker. <laughs> he'll stay. As we sit yes. on this podcast, maybe we'll bring Jonathan Abrams. We'll bring a laptop out here. <laughs> I, 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 mean, oh, I just Abrams, want to say that yes. I, I think... I'm still totally fine with the Chase Young signing. They needed to do something with the pass rush. They needed to do it to address it in a way uh, where they could give themselves some extremely high upside there. Um, they have done a good job coaching up defensive linemen in the past. I know they they haven't they didn't get a lot out of Foskey last year. Turner's obviously been hurt. Um, Davenport was hurt, but when guys have been on the field for them, like you've seen Carl Granderson develop. You've seen Cam Jordan perform at a very high level for a very long time here. I think. If they are comfortable with with the medical situation and, and assuming he'll be back on the field in time for the opener, I still think that's that's a very good signing. And, and they have some, as we talked about with the yeah. contract details, they have some some additional, um, I guess, security in the event that he's not able to play. Uh, so I just think I still think it was worth the signing. Um, I think he could still be potentially a very good player here. It's just this is just part of the deal with where the Saints are at right now. Is they they kind of have to look for bargains and hope they hit i don't mind a gamble though i mean you're in a situation where you've been eight nine nine and eight the last two years last three years right uh no it was it was nine and eight seven and ten then nine and eight you're kind of stuck in the middle of the nfl your roster's not getting any younger pass rush is an area where if you get it right it can transform your entire defense particularly with what they've got the talent they've got on the back end if this works it is something that the saints could afford that could kind of push them up into that 10-11 win range and then and then you're talking about competing for, you know, playoff wins. 
Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk about the contract. I mean, let's just imagine the worst case scenario. And he has a he has up to almost eight million dollars in per game roster bonuses. What that looks like is it's four hundred and seventy thousand that he gets per game. And so if he misses time, if he misses four games, let's say, you know, whatever that is times four, almost two million, almost two million. That that's what the Saints would save now. If he's a disaster to the point where they would want to cut him in camp, the way it's been explained to me is that he would, they would still have to guarantee that eight million. That's why Adam Schefter put thirteen million fully guaranteed, is because I guess with the way roster bonuses work, at least according to this guy from Pro Football Focus I was talking to, is that you still have to guarantee that portion of the salary, but you can recoup it kind of later, like it's still paid out to him over the, a weekly contract rate, but I guess if they part ways, it's different. So I, I think they have baked in some insurance to this a little bit, some security. So I, I don't think it's a terrible deal. I think it's smart like to lower the base salary and then kind of try and make up that money later. But I, I also think that just goes back to Chase Young's lack of options. If he plays 17 games for you, then yeah, that's $13 great. million dollars is well worth it for – potentially an impact pass rusher that's like the 32nd highest paid edge rusher in the nfl that'll that'll work so if he's a starting caliber edge rusher by definition you got a bargain um and i don't i don't think that that's certainly not outside the realm of possibility i mean i I will say they say he won't be ready for training camp but will be ready for the start of the regular season that's touch and go jeff like if i mean if you're ready the second week of training camp all right no problem uh, Demario Davis sat out a lot of training camp last year and was just fine. But if you're not ready until after the preseason games are over or something like that, I mean, then you're not starting the regular season. Then this goes into the season. We, you, you don't know how ready the guy is. His 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 shape might not be there. I mean, it's it could be problematic. Yeah, but I do think of all positions, that's one of the ones you can – I mean, he's going to be in a rotation anyway. Uh, I don't know how many – we looked at his snap count last year. He's going to be He's going to be a rotational guy here. Uh, I don't think that's as big a deal. Like I remember famously Joe Johnson missing all a training camp with an injury and coming in and getting like two and a half sacks first game. So um, that's one position I, w- I wouldn't worry about as much. But, you know, I, I do think the injury obviously had to have some some impact on why teams weren't as interested in him because there's a lot of teams in the league. I mean, there's, it's the old Bill Parcells strategy of, this guy was picked high for a reason, right? He had a ton of talent. Um, everyone graded him probably at the top of their boards in the draft. Let's get him in our building and see what we can get out of him. I mean, that's a very common strategy around the NFL. So for there to be not that much interest in him, I think speaks to probably the medicals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and also he's had some issues in the past with uh, questions about commitment and other injuries and I, I don't know. It's a risk. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I think the part we haven't talked about here, which is interesting, is Chase Young got a lot of flack for this based on what I tweeted out there of he said the Saints were winning culture and wants to be part of that culture. And the Saints have had a lot of focus on kind of their culture. Like, is he the right type of guy to bring in to to fix that? And I'm not saying anything about his character. Like, it was just interesting to watch that situation develop because – in year one of Chase Young's tenure, a lot of players kind of gravitated toward him to where he kind of emerged as the leader of the defense, but it was much more by, like, that was a role that maybe he didn't necessarily try to do or want to do, and then because of the injury, he kind of faded more into the background and wasn't necessarily that tone setter. So I just I kind of wonder, I want to see how it plays out here. Is is he that culture guy? Is, is he going to set a tone? Is he going to help? fix those issues, those commitment issues that they talked about at the end of the season. Just inter- it, It's something that I think is worth monitoring. What, Matt, what's his size? What, what, what is he at? He's 6'5". Uh, I think he plays at 265, something yeah, like that. That's a little smaller than the Saints typically have at defensive end. I think it's interesting. Jeff Ireland talked about that. I think they're going to a little bit of a different prototype there. I mean, they like their – I mean, Carl Granderson was almost that exact same size, and he got up to 280. Okay. Yeah. You know, they, they want their guy stout and hold the edge, set the edge against the run. So I do think that's interesting. He's, I know he's a strong guy for even for that size, but it'll be interesting to see if that's what he ends up playing at here. 
Yeah, and he was a pretty good run defender, at least. I would even say, like, last season he, he was good at it. Now I know the Gibbs run and the effort thing, but, like, if you look at, again, back to his rookie year, there's this play in the Pittsburgh game where he, like, just crashes down at the goal line and just completely stops what, you know, Pittsburgh. He saved a touchdown, basically, and just a lot of those types of plays that, you know, especially, like, that rookie year, he only finished with seven and a half sacks, but, God, he was everywhere a lot of the time, and so, you know, who knows if he can get back to that, but I, I he he's a really interesting talent. It's interesting that the Saints have had this culture discussion. It's a very interesting point, and that he has that in him. As a rookie, he was a yeah. leader, and I'm sure he wasn't a captain as a rookie, but that type of player, the injuries push that into the background, but he, he's got it in him, in other words, and so that's yeah. that could be part of this, this discussion, too. If memory it's, serves, I believe... They made him a captain at the end of the season because Dwayne Haskins lost his captainship. <laughs> Whole separate story of he was caught partying after a game during COVID. Anyway, um, yeah, I think they made him a captain at the end of the year, if memory serves. But he was he was definitely a guy. If if not, then people gravitated to and wanted him to be that guy, and then just it didn't really unfold that way. As the Commanders turn. Matthew <laughs> Paris. Yeah. I mean, they they've got the yeah they've got the alpha. The, the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he doesn't well, even have defense, to do that here. In defense, regardless. I, I mean, you up and down that that uh, that whole starting eleven. You got guys at each position group who are kind of the the people guys turn to. So, yeah, I think maybe it, that could be what he was referencing when when he came in here. Is he, they've got a lot of veteran leadership on the defense and a lot of guys who've won a lot of games here. Um, yeah, you know, maybe that's that's good for him to be around that sort of thing. Put his locker next to Cam's. Maybe to I, don't, I don't know. They they do they ever he since uh, ever since COVID they started mixing the the lockers up. Maybe he's maybe he's gonna be next to Demario. Who knows? Um, they don't have the defensive line. All used to be in one corner. The the running backs all used to be in one corner. The receivers and, the, and now it's all jumbled up. He was a double locker room guy and for double locker, oh, double guy, locker and, guy. Yeah. I don't think he'll be but that. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you're watching the Saints Insider Podcast for March 20th on the SaintsOnNola.com YouTube channel. Subscribe, like, share with your friends, all that good stuff. Sign up for notifications. We appreciate you. Uh, moving the discussion on to some of the other moves the Saints have done. Chase Young, obviously, the big splash. We talked about Willie Gay last week also, um, and they have re-signed a couple of guys, Jonathan Abram, which just happened, and, uh, and also Ugo Amadi. And then they've gone out and kind of gone bargain basement hunting. Nathan Peterman at quarterback, uh, um, Stanley Morgan and Cedric Wilson, Cedric Wilson at wide receiver, um, Ali Udo. and Ali Udo at offensive line. Any of these moves stick out to you, Luke, uh, or just just depth? Uh, I think the Cedric Wilson one is probably the most interesting out of those. I think out of those uh, those what four other signings you mentioned. Um, I think he's the only one who got a two year deal. Um, he's probably had the most NFL success out of those, out of that group. Um, and yeah, I think he could fit, fill, uh, an interesting role within this offense. Um, as somebody who's a little bit bigger than the receivers they have on the roster, somebody who, um, you know, frankly has caught a lot of the balls thrown his way, um, moved the chains a lot in his career. Uh, something like 65% of his catches or 70% of his catches have gone for first downs uh, during his time with the with the Miami Dolphins. So um, you know, he wasn't used a lot. I, I think his career high like uh, targets in a single season was 61 with the Cowboys in 2021. Um, but you know maybe there's there's a little bit more there. Um, but I, I still think that he's a role player. Yeah, you know, just uh, maybe out of that group that we were talking about maybe has the the biggest potential role with this team instead of uh you know offensive lineman signing maybe he's a swing offensive lineman gets a couple starts jeff the saints twitter tw twitter mafia was uh upset that the saints did not pay the price for justin fields that the steelers did and said they signed nathan peterman to be to compete to be Derek carr's backup uh i don't i don't think any of us are surprised that they didn't bringing in fields would be akin to having another not, not that they're totally similar players, but Jameis Winston in the building, who's a former starter, who everyone is kind of clamoring for, and I, th I think they wanted to avoid that situation. Yeah, look, I, I think 
the writing was on the wall when Jameis Winston left. They were going to go a little cheaper, the backup quarterback position, maybe with Jay Kaner riding that rookie, uh, you know, second year contract that he's on. Um, and that, I mean, Luke's alluded to it. I mean, they they're they're looking for every possible way they can try to cut corners on the roster because I think they're in a little bit of a soft reset on the roster right now trying to manage the cap I mean Mickey said it a year ago they want to try and get back a little bit toward the middle of the pack in terms of their salary cap and I know they keep shoving money down the road but they're also they're also making some tough decisions and I think the Jameis Winston was a good example of they're going to go a little cheaper back up and they're, they're rolling the dice and probably a calculated risk here that Carr is going to stay healthy. I mean, he he does have a credible track record of durability, uh, so I think they're comfortable with that, especially after what how he played through injuries last year. Well, and you use the fourth round pick on Jake Hanner for a reason, you know. If if you're just gonna gonna have him inactive on game days in perpetuity until it's time for him to sign with another team, then like, what's the point of using the pick? Uh, I, I know they liked what they saw to him last year. Um, you know, and you know, just being frank, this is this is not a team that should have these like lofty Super Bowl aspirations right now. Um, what? So, you know, I, I think I think it was always smart to have the the quarterback with starting high level starting experience as your backup when you had a, a roster that you were like, yes, this is a team that can win a Super Bowl. Um, right now, I, I mean, if if Derek Carr were to go down, I. I yeah, I don't know if you think a backup is going to be leading this team to a Super Bowl with this roster. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to me to see what you got in Jake Hayner. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if, if that were to happen, especially early in the season, and I know no one in the building will say this, but it might be might be kind of halfway tanking time. Um, you know, if you don't have that, unless you're going to go make a trade, I don't know. This, this is all discussion for down the road, but Nathan Peterman will compete with Jake Hayner for the backup. By the way, the last, the last Saints quarterback to start a game who was drafted was Ian Book. And that was in that crazy COVID game where no one was available in the 2021 season. Um, before that, I have no idea who it would have been. It would have been, shoot, <laughs> probably in the I don't think early, Mark Bulger, early 2000s. Yeah, I don't think Mark Bulger ever started <laughs> We get an answer maybe, for you on I mean, Danny, Danny Werfel. The, he ended up going to the Pro Bowl, Mark Bulger did with the Rams. The Rams. Yeah, but I don't think he ever played not for the, the, the Saints. Saints. No, but like Luke makes a great point. I mean, like I think everyone's gotten – kind of over the top of on this thing. I mean, like Aiden O'Connell was drafted in a very similar position to Jake Hayner and did just fine in a lot of games, won some games. Uh, it happens all the time. I mean, Brock Purdy, you know, was drafted even further down. Clint Kubiak, that offensive staff, I think would feel comfortable in fashioning a game plan with Jake Hayner. Uh, it goes on all the time around the league. So I, I think everyone's gotten a little – um, out of sorts on the backup quarterback situation. Well, and the Saints had a, an, an extremely unique backup situation for several years. They, they're, I don't think I can think of another NFL team that just consistently always had a starter as their backup. You know, a guy who had started a ton of games in the NFL, won a lot of games in the NFL. Yeah. Teddy Bridgewater, Andy Dalton, Jameis Winston. He, I mean, and they still have Taysom Hill on the roster, who's seven, I was seven, and, seven and two as a starting quarterback. So I, I think they're completely fine. They're totally fine in that position. There's I, look, I'm a big. I think Justin Fields is still a good quarterback. I, I, you know, even though he was traded for a six round pick, and a lot of people are taking that as a sign that the NFL doesn't really believe in him. I think that's kind of bogus. I still think I, like I would have been excited to have him on the roster, but like I don't think they're doing anything bad. I, I think the the situation you know was just so unique over the last several years that people have just kind of become accustomed to having to having two starting level quarterbacks in your roster. And frankly, if Carr goes down I, and they don't want to go to Hena, I think there will probably be someone out there like Carson Wentz is still unsigned. Oh, but I, a Josh Dobbs-esque trade. Yeah, he yeah. just, yeah, like I, I do think you could salvage the position if they really wanted to try and go for it. I don't think it'd be a, a solution, but, you know, we talk about Hainer versus Peterman. It's more of a problem if Jake Hainer can't beat out Nathan Peterman and in yeah, this competition, that's, that's, and so that's like, a great point. they are just setting him up here to go through a, a training camp battle, but really it's going to be Hayner's position. I mean, they, they drafted him with the fourth round pick. It's just more, I think you bring in Peterman just to see where Hayner's at versus rather, all right, is Nathan Peterman on a 
going to be our number two. It's really more of a test for Hayner, I think. I, I, I think, think uh, I think Saints legend Blake Bortles is still available too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I think it'll be interesting to see what Kubiak and the staff say about Taysom Hill. Because depending on the extent of an injury, if Carr were to go down, if it were one or two games, you could win with Taysom Hill. He's proven that. You could also probably make the case for Hayner too. But, I mean, this is a guy – I think I think having Hill on the roster is a great luxury to have because he, he really does play so many positions that, that it allows you maybe to get away with just two quarterbacks on the yeah. roster in the end because of his, his versatility. Good points all. A uh, quick word on, on pro days coming up. Uh, as we as we sort of the owners meetings are next week and then we'll be fully like in draft mode uh I, all of this n- no offense to to uh Ali Udo who I think was signed as offensive line depth but all of this to me sort of points to the Saints are going to target an offensive lineman if not with their first pick then certainly with their second pick in the draft uh what pro days over the next couple of weeks as they start to sprinkle out are y'all keeping an eye on uh or do you think the Saints might be keeping an eye on oh well, Alabama's I think for sure. Uh, J.C. Latham didn't test at the combine. I'm, I'm expecting him to test at the pro, pro day, and um, he's definitely somebody who is who should be in the mix for them at number 14. Um, Dallas Turner also there. Dallas yeah. Turner as well. Although it's 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 starting to look more and more like uh, like he's going to be one of the first defensive players off the board, um, just because he tested so well and you know the guy's a freak. I, I think he's going to be gone in top 10. Um, so I, I definitely want to see what J.C. Latham does, and and you know I'll be I'll be interested in kind of keeping an eye out for uh, Olu Fushanu at, at Penn State. You know he's, he's somebody that maybe has kind of fallen a little bit after the combine. Um, somebody who might be available within range, and like like we've said before, didn't give up a sack in his last two years at Penn State against some pretty good some pretty good edge rushers there in the Big Ten. Um, yeah, I think really <laughs> just looking at all these top tackles. And, and seeing how they perform at these pro days. I, I think that's that's really what I'm keeping an eye on. And then, yeah, obviously at LSU, I, I kind of want to see, uh, you know, what Jaden Daniels does. If anything, I want to see what Brian Thomas does. I think he's he's an intriguing potential option there. Um, yeah, some stuff to keep an eye on. You guys got anybody else? I'm just interested to see what Malik Neighbors runs after <laughs> not doing it at the combine. I, I do think it's... The pro days serve as an opportunity now, especially because guys are routinely skipping out on performing at the combine. So it's more of a reflection point for teams to try and get that data. Thought it was interesting. Marvin Harrison isn't going to test at his combine. I don't really know. Or at his pro day, I don't know what's up with that. But it'll be interesting. I'm. I think one of it has nothing to do necessarily with the Saints, but I'm interested to see what the what order the receivers go in this draft. It seems like a really special group and yeah i guess it's yeah, your preferred no choice there either. yeah like i feel like in december everybody's like well it's going to be marvin harrison jr and then everybody after that and i've you've seen a lot of stuff go out and it's like right. roma dunze might be the first receiver taken malik neighbors yeah a lot of, there was this big weird discussion on twitter where everybody all of a sudden is like actually i think malik neighbors is better than marvin harrison jr and right. um it, you know it, it's going to be really fascinating to see how that how that plays out i think there's pretty clearly three top guys at that position in this in this draft but like what order they fall in i, I think it's just yeah. going to depend on the individual teams making the picks and oh. to circle it back to the saints i mean if like when when we've talked about brian thomas at 14 it seems high to me just personally but maybe with an excellent pro day and you know the buzz starts to build and maybe after that it, it seems like okay maybe this would actually be more of his range yeah and i mean like just just you know when you think about when you think about who is making the most money in the NFL right now, I, yeah, I just feel like <laughs> it's it's receivers, it's defensive ends, and quarterbacks, and and offensive tackles. And I think that's why you always have to keep somebody like Brian Thomas, you know, that that fourth, fifth receiver, yeah. um, who's a kid from Texas, Xavier something. McKinney? Or, no, 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 Xavier that's... Worthy. Oh, Mitchell. I'm thinking uh, of all no, my Donnie Zavers. Mitchell. Donnie Mitchell. Uh, Xavier Xavier was a kid who ran like a four. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, no, like a Donnie Mitchell. You know, I, uh, many past years might be a second round prospect. I, you know, you see he, he could get pushed into the top twenty. I, I mean, it's just the position's so valuable. These guys are going to be making. Justin Jefferson's going to sign a deal that's going to pay him probably thirty five, thirty six million dollars a year. You know, it was only six years ago 
that Mike Thomas set the new standard for wide receiver money making like 19.5. It's almost doubled. Um, so like I, I think that it, you see that trend and, and you see, okay, well, we've got to be able to have this guy affordable for five years. Um, so receivers, offensive tackles, quarterbacks, defensive ends, are all, they're going to make up the top highest portions of the draft uh, because you have to try to get these guys at a discount when you can. Yeah. That's why Brian Thomas, I think, could be a top 15 pick. Just yeah. so I, I got one for you. What, what if Brock Bowers is there? It's an I interesting mean, I, thought. I mean, I, I would consider him. I damn sure would. Yeah. I mean, the guy's a playmaker. He can run after the catch, gives them an element to their offense they might not have. Yeah. I mean, well, it's you, you take the value there, right? And, and if there's a huge run on pass catchers in the top 12 picks, that's probably good for the Saints, too, because it means they end up with one of the top two or three offensive linemen if that's the direction they choose to go. So, correct. Uh, yeah, they, I mean, there's a lot of ways this could be very beneficial for the Saints. Yeah. All right, so we'll, we'll dive a lot more into draft talk as we go. Uh, owners meetings next week. We're going to end today, wrap things up, and try to catch the end of this Jonathan Abram call. Um, final four picks. Matt, what, uh, you know, f- first of all, Rod Walker's not here. He gave me his final four picks. He's got, he's got UConn winning it all, chalk. Uh, he's also got the number one seeds, Houston and Purdue on the other side, chalk. And then he picked Arizona, the number two seed. Uh, and he went with South Carolina on the women's side, chalk. So, chalk Walker, what you got, Matt? <laughs> okay, well, as like Luke, I looked at the bracket this morning. So, I'm doing this off memory when I don't know if the <laughs> the regions are right, but... uh. I think I have Duke coming out of uh, Purdue section. That's Houston section, actually. Yeah, Houston. Yeah. At least one of us Duke. knows the break. <laughs> okay. Um, UConn. We'll just uh, Creighton out of uh, Creighton's what? out of Purdue section. Purdue yeah. section, and then Arizona was the other one. All right. right. So and who wins it all? Uh, we'll say. Uh, we'll just say Duke. I don't know. All right. Duke is a four seed. Mm. Yeah. All right, so I can't say LSU this time. You can say uh, that for the women. Because they already got knocked out of the NIT. Go Tigers. Um, so uh, I'm actually uh, very similar to Rod. I'm looking at this because, uh, again, I literally looked at this five minutes before we started recording. Uh, I got UConn, Arizona, Houston, and Kansas uh, as my final four. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. And I've got uh, UConn over Kansas in the, in the championship game. Kansas, Kansas best players out with an injury, but back to back. That, that, chaos, man. You there you know. go. There you yeah. go. They That's rallied how much around. I know them. about yeah. college basketball. <laughs> it's pro- that means I'm probably going to be right. I, I, I almost, uh, I almost went with Creighton instead of Kansas, but I decided to go Kansas. Um, yeah. I almost also went with Kentucky just to make Jeff mad. How far mm-hmm. are Louisville going? Soon, when we get Dusty May, we'll be back. All right, back mm-hmm. in the mix. Okay, so I've been saving to Paul. I hate to say it, but I, I think Kentucky's got a great shot to win it all. I, I, they're they're the most talented team. In the tournament, that's the least haterific thing you said in a but long time. But they have one of the worst bench coaches in the tournament, mm-hmm. so that's more they've likely. got to overcome Cal's lack of ability. Somewhere along the way, Kentucky's going to have a game where they overlook somebody and they got to survive it. And if they do, when they get matched up against Houston, say, in the if they get that far, they'll beat Houston because they'll be ready to play that game. The, the game that Kentucky trips up is St. Peter's. You know when they're overlooking Texas Tech. Right, to Texas so Tech. Kansas State a few years yeah. ago. But if they get to, like, the regional final, I, unfortunately, I think they might win it all. UConn's probably the only team, I think, that can match them talent-wise. But I actually think it's going to be a big SEC year. Like, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Auburn – matter of fact, I, I've got Kentucky and Tennessee coming out, rematching again of their respective, uh, you know, brackets. And then I think the chaos bracket's going to be the West. Like I, I think I've, I like St. Mary's to make it Ooh. come out of that. I just think that North Carolina, I think they're going to go out early. And UConn's got so much pressure on them, uh, they, could, they could fall victim to an upset. So who but wins it all? Kentucky, I think. I got Kentucky. Okay. I'm going to go. I, I did take UConn in the Final Four. I couldn't resist that, although I, I like your pick of Auburn. I think they could, they could give mm-hmm. UConn trouble. Um, and then I've got Arizona, Marquette, and Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And I'm going with uh, – Arizona to win it all. First time since 97. Look, I, I, I'm just proud of myself that uh, as a Wisconsin native, I, I, I went against my uh, my desire to pick either Marquette or Wisconsin in, uh, coming out of that bracket. That was very disciplined of you. Thank you. Yeah. Shaka Smart 
He's got them going to Marquette. And they're getting Wisconsin their best player back. So. Look good early, and then they they really flattened yeah, out. Yeah, you know, it's I grew up watching a lot of Wisconsin basketball, and uh, and just constantly being disappointed in the in, in during tournament times. So, were you more of a Sam know. Decker or a Frank the Tank guy? That was actually a little bit after my mm. my big uh, right. my big Wisconsin basketball guy was Michael Finley. Oh, okay, yeah. That was like true childhood Wisconsin basketball era. Uh, Devin uh, Devin Harris. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. he was big time. By the a way, a lot of Dallas Mavericks that you're just like rattling off too. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm more of a Phoenix Suns era Michael Finley kind of guy. Mm. When I was in junior high and into high school, New Mexico made the tournament four straight years, and they won a game in the tournament four straight years, and then they lost their second round game all four years. They have never made the Sweet Sixteen in school history. It's happening this year, baby. Lobos to the Sweet 16. Don't sleep on Will Wade's McNeese Cowboys. Gonzaga's going to take care of that. Willie the Kid and the Bayou Bandits, baby. The Bayou Bandits. Their their number's too low. I just saw they were only like five-point favorites. Yeah. uh, Gonzaga. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, that's going to do it for our uh, Saints Insider for March the 20th. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to the SaintsOnNola.com YouTube channel. Uh, Hit the like button, subscribe button. Appreciate all of you. Norman Bell's our producer. That's Matthew Paris. Luke Johnson and Jeff Duncan, I'm Zach Ewing, and we'll see you next time.